Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome this afternoon to members of the Boston University community and also to parents are here because this is Parents Weekend and I know that um, some parents have come from very far away uh, to see their son or daughter uh, who are here at Boston University, many of them for the first time. So uh, we're really glad to have you here. This afternoon, we're going to have our annual uh, Dudley Allen Sargent Lecture, and this is the 11th lecture in the series. Uh, the series started um, in order to commemorate our founder, Dr. Dudley Allen Sargent, uh, who was an amazing person. He was a person who, in the 1860s, realized the importance of diet and exercise and those sorts of things towards health promotion. And uh, he started a college of physical education and training, and it eventually moved to Boston University in 1929. And so the uh, series of lectures was started um, in order to commemorate uh, the fact that it moved to Boston University. So every year we try to find a preeminent lecturer who will come and talk to the Boston University community about a topical area uh, that has something to do with uh, human health. And uh, we're really delighted uh, to have the speaker that we have today. So it's, uh, it's a thrill and really an honor to have Dr. Richard Besser here with us uh, today. Dr. Besser um, is probably known to many of you now because he's seen um, on the nightly news, um, being the ABC uh, senior health correspondent um, and uh, appearing on news uh, frequently. Uh, he's had a very illustrious career as a physician um, and also working for the Center for Infectious uh, Disease and also the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and in fact, he was the uh, lead last year when he was the acting director of the CDC in terms of helping uh, the country figure out what to do about the H1N1 uh, flu and virus. So we're really delighted to have him here today uh, to talk about uh, his views about these things. So Dr. Besser, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Dean, Dean Waters. It's a real uh, privilege to be here to, to give this, this lecture. Um, I, I want to uh, thank you for the invitation. I want to thank Assistant Dean um, Linda Martin, who's a, a dear old friend, for uh, uh, arranging this. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's wonderful to be up here in Boston, um, where I started my career actually in public health, investigating an outbreak over at the uh, Boston Children's Hospital, uh, an outbreak of kidney failure from apple cider. Um, and uh, I also want to thank Lisa Tornator for all the uh, arrangements to, to get me up here. Um, but giving this lecture that's named after a, a leader uh, in health who focused on physical activity and nutrition is also special uh, to me. Uh, one of the areas that I, I really hope to be able to focus on at ABC News is the role of, of, of nutrition and physical activity in health. If you look at the big health problems that we face, um, those of you who are students here are going to have the privilege of inheriting those problems and working on the solutions to those problems. Um, so I think the job market will be, will be quite good uh, for, for what you're doing. Um, but, but that's a different talk. Today I, I'm here to talk about uh, pandemics, public health, and, and political change. And um, I really had a, a tremendous uh, opportunity this year when I was serving as the acting director at CDC to, uh, to really see how the country and the world responded to the first pandemic in, in, in 40 years. And it was an incredible experience for me, um, one that I'm still processing. And as, as a nation, we're still going through this pandemic, so we're all, we're all processing this. Um, to date, there have been millions of cases around the world. Uh, in the U.S., there have been more than 10,000 people hospitalized. Uh, more than 1,000 people have died. Um, but if you look at the polls, uh, about half, half of uh, Americans think that this is something we have to take seriously and, and try and prevent. And the other half uh, think it's much ado, much ado about nothing. And um, so I'm, I'm going to try and give you a flavor for what things were like in the spring when this was first appearing. A very different feel to how it feels uh, around the country now. Uh, and I think uh, as, as someone who's focusing on health communication and how that impacts on people's choices, uh, I think uh, we really in, in public health have our work cut out for us. Uh, but I wanted to first, first um, go through a little bit around how I got in the position to do what, what uh, I was able to do and observe what I was able to observe. <coughs> and I'm getting over a cold, which is not swine flu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, 
Uh, in, I see in the audience uh, Dan Sossen, who's a, a very good friend and colleague from CDC, who uh, is in the job at CDC that I had before I, uh, I left for ABC. And it's wonderful to see him and his family here. Uh, but uh, last January, um, I, was, I was serving as the Director of Emergency Preparedness and Response at CDC, and we had uh, arranged a trip to Israel uh, to learn about preparedness. Um, how does a country that has seen as many emergencies as Israel prepare for the unknown? And how does the public prepare for, for what may come their way? And so as part of a, a Harvard delegation, I had the opportunity to go and, and, and observe and meet with health leaders uh, around Israel. Um, the timing was such that two hours after we arrived, Israel moved troops into Gaza. And it uh, was really a, an incredible two weeks seeing crisis management during a crisis, seeing how the public responded to a crisis and the unknown as to whether there would be uh, chemical weapons lobbing in from sympathetic countries or, or what would take place. And it provided a lot of insights to me in, in how you prepare a country and how people view issues of, of, of preparedness. So it was in this context that, that we were meeting with a lot of the, the folks from Israel and I got a call um, during one of the meetings and I came out and it was someone from uh, the Obama transition team who said, if you were asked to be the acting director of CDC, uh, would you do it? And I said, yes. Um, uh, you know, it, it, to me, that's the dream job, being able to run uh, the nation's premier uh, public health agency. And they said, okay, we'll get back to you. <laughs> and so I went back in and continued and, 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 and spent the week. And then the following week, they, they called and they said, okay, um, you're going to get asked to be the, the acting director of CDC. We don't know exactly when. I said, well, for how long? And they said, well, you know, probably just a few weeks. Uh, we want you to take the job and, and, and treat it as your own. And, um, you know, it's not caretaker. If there are changes you have to make, make those changes. But, you know, it'll be a few weeks you know, after the inauguration. Dash will get confirmed. They'll name the director of CDC. And, and that'll be it. And so I was like, okay, you know, this sounds, this sounds like a good opportunity. Um, and they, I said, well, when do I start? They said, well, we don't know that yet. We'll, we'll get back to you. And so I came back to, to Atlanta, and they said, oh, you can't tell anyone. Um, well, I actually did. I, I told one, I, apart from my wife, I told one person who's actually in the room, um, because I had to ask him if he would take the job if I got asked to be the acting director. Uh, so went back to Atlanta, and I was working as a volunteer pediatrician in a clinic, and it was the Thursday. It was two days after the inauguration. And the phone rings, uh, my cell phone rings. I, I step out. I was doing a physical on a 15-year-old uh, boy. And uh, they say, is this, is this uh, Rich Besser? I said, yes. They said, well, this is the Office of Personnel at uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, uh, I said, yes. They said, uh, you're now the acting director of CDC. <laughs> and I said, is there someone I can talk to about this? And they said, we'll get back to you. <laughs> So that began my time as, as acting director of CDC. And uh, the following day, uh, I figured I need to understand what they want in this job because this is a, you know, a large agency and um, there's a lot of things that I could do during my three weeks. And um, I didn't know, which, you know where to start. So I, I, uh, I went up to, to Washington the, the following day. They were having a meeting of all the acting heads of, of, of agencies. and. Um, there, were no, there was no permanent political layer in yet. The president had just been inaugurated, so there was no secretary or assistant secretaries or any of those people in place. There was an acting chief of staff, and he was the most senior person. And so I met with him and said, you know, how do you view CDC? Do you think that it's in, in need of stabilization, uh, minor changes, or major overhaul? And he said, major overhaul. And I said, why? In what respect? He said, well, for too long, the agency has focused on high consequence, low probability events. Those kind of things that if they happen, will be really bad, but have a very low probability of happening. And you've not focused on those health problems like chronic disease, they're affecting us every day. And you know, I thought about that for a second because this is something that uh, over the past four years has been lobbed my way as a criticism uh, by many. And, and my response was, why in public health do we have to choose between the two? 
You know, why can't we be tackling the, the, the urgent realities, those, those, those health issues that we face every day, but also be ready for the next pandemic or a terrorist attack or a new emerging infection like SARS? Um, and he, he looked at me and he, he, he couldn't come up with a good answer, but in public health and in health, we've always had to take this one pie that was fixed and divide it up and decide which things are we gonna tackle. And what I think that this pandemic is, 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 is showing, it, it, it's demonstrating the importance of being able to do both. Um, you know, there was a feeling that all of the efforts around pandemic preparedness were a, a waste of time. Um, the last administration invested billions of dollars in pandemic preparedness. There was a summit held, I don't know if everyone remembers, but there was a summit held in every state to try and pull coalitions together to plan. Well, they weren't planning for swine flu. We were all planning for bird flu. Um, and uh, those efforts involved development of a national strategy, national operational plans. Uh, we distributed billions of dollars to the states so that they could do planning on how they would distribute vaccine, how they would distribute antivirals, um, how they would keep track of cases, how they would measure the impact and severity, what we would do with borders if, if, uh, if there were issues uh, with, with border control, uh, quarantine. All of these issues were worked through around, around bird flu. Um, and then um, uh, exercising. At CDC, we held full-scale exercises uh, three times a year for two days, where we worked through what would take place in the event of a pandemic. And I have to say that had we not undertaken those things uh, back in April when the pandemic hit, we would have been spending the first weeks explaining to people what is flu, how does it spread, what measures do you have to take. The efforts that took place in, in preparing for bird flu, I think, left us in, in really good shape for, uh, for what we had, which was not bird flu, but, but pig flu. Uh, it's not really pig flu. It's, H, it's novel H1N1 2009 strain flu, um, which is a, a bit of a mouthful. So, uh, you know, going back to, to, to April, it was April, April 22nd, it was a Wednesday. And for years, we'd been having at CDC a weekly pandemic preparedness meeting. And the director chaired this, and it was reviewing everything that the agency was doing in the various lanes to prepare for a pandemic. And the goal was to be the first time in history that we were prepared for a pandemic. Um, they, we weren't prepared in 1918, we weren't prepared in 56 or 68, but the goal was to be prepared this time, this time around. <clears throat> and so this, during this meeting, um, I'd asked for a presentation about these, these two cases we had just heard about of, of swine flu. There'd been two children in, in Southern California, in San Diego and Imperial County, who had developed flu. Um, the strain that was identified was not a typical human strain. It was a strain that was associated with swine. And this was unusual. Uh, in the past five years, there had been about 10 cases of flu that was related to, to, to swine. Um, most influenza strains are specific to a, a species. And so there's pig strains, there's bird strains, there's human strains. And usually, they don't cross over all that easily. Um, one of the things you worry about for pandemics occurring is if they cross over very, very easily. So there have been these cases, and then there were these two cases in Southern California. Well, one case isn't really unusual. It's, it's something you want to keep your eye on. Two cases in the same area, those of you who've done any epidemiology, it's like, okay, that's a little unusual. Um, then CDC put out a call to look for more cases, and all of a sudden they found two more cases in Texas. And the first thing you do is say, okay, is there any connection? Are these cousins? Have they been together? There wasn't a connection. And so this was, this was a little worrisome. And so there was a presentation on this Wednesday about these four cases that were, that were identified around the country. Uh, and oh, by the way, there's this respiratory infection going on in Mexico, and no one knows what it is, but a lot of people are dying, and it looks really, really bad. And so, uh, uh, we decided in that meeting to activate our emergency operations center at CDC so that we could keep track of what was going on. And a call was put out around the country to health departments to ramp up the surveillance that they had been planning for through their, their pandemic preparedness and look for cases and do testing and get the labs geared up so that they could do testing. Uh, thankfully, CDC had already begun to develop or had completed the development of a rapid test, a, a PCR test, 
that could be used for identifying swine flu strains. They'd done that because there'd been these 10 cases over the past four years. And this, the, uh, the lab then began to ramp up production of test kits so that these could go out to state labs to look for, for more cases. Uh, the next day, uh, it was, it was the, the Thursday, um, I got a call from a colleague up in Canada who was doing some work on the Mexico strains. Um, and he had, they had received the, the information on the isolates that, that we had in the U.S. And he said, um, I need to tell you something. The strain in Mexico is the same strain you're seeing in the U.S. And um, that was concerning. You know, here you have cases in the U.S. You have something going on in Mexico that looks really, really bad. And uh, at that point, I decided need to let uh, need to let the folks in Washington know. <laughs> and so um, I sent word up to my contact at the department and said, "We need to have a call tonight. We have a situation going on uh, that I'm concerned about. I think that the White House needs to know about this. Uh, we've got cases in Mexico. We have cases in the U.S. We think they're related." <laughs> and they said, "Okay, we'll you know we'll have a call this evening." And then a couple hours later, I get an email back from someone else saying, we're all kind of busy this evening. Can we do it tomorrow at 10? <laughs> and uh, um, I, I sent a message back up, no. Um, this, is, this is one of those for real moments. We need this call uh, tonight. And so we got on the, uh, the phone and, and uh, had the folks from the department who were in the leadership po uh, positions. But again, none of the political appointees were, were, were in place yet. And, um, I explained the situation to the new chief of staff, who had been on board about a week, and said, you know, we're concerned about this. Uh, we're concerned that this could be the start of a, of a pandemic. And she said, well, on a scale of, eight to, of 1 to 10, how concerned are you? And I said, 8. And she said, 8? <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah. I said, you know, for there to be a pandemic, what you need to see is a new strain, okay? Uh, a strain that's not like uh, strains of flu that have gone in the community. It has to be able to cause, uh, cause disease. And what we were hearing in Mexico was very severe disease. You need a population that is at risk that doesn't have immunity to this. And from what we were seeing in Mexico, it looked like that, that was the case. And so we had what we thought in Atlanta was the makings of a potential pandemic strain and a potential uh, uh, pandemic. And so we get off the phone. And those who were in the uh, room with me were like, I don't know if I would have said eight. You know, I, I, I was, you know, I think I was more like a five. And it, it was, <laughs> but whatever it was, it got people's attention, and and um, and it kind of kicked off the 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 broader federal response to the to the pandemic. Um, but you know, the title of my talk has political change in there, and and. Um, the reason I was asked to be acting director at CDC was that I had been running the, the terrorism preparedness and emergency response for four years. And the feeling was that if something bad happened, it would be good to have in leadership positions in the government people who knew how to do response and were comfortable with the, with the response planning. And, um, and I think it was, a, it was a good choice because it meant that the people in leadership positions in the various parts of, of, of uh, health and human services and uh, also over in Department of Homeland Security, we'd all worked together before and we knew how this was supposed to, uh, supposed to um, uh, operate. I wanted to uh, uh, talk a little bit about what our strategy was at, at this point in the, in the uh, response. And um, we, we kind of went over these principles at CDC every day during our briefing to make sure that we were on the same page, we all knew what we were trying to, to accomplish. Um, and and uh, every time I got up to do a press conference or another setting, I would go through them so that people were clear. Um, the first was that uh, containment of this was not possible. Uh, we had done all this fantastic planning for bird flu. And in the scenarios, bird flu would start usually in Java, in a little remote village, and, uh, or in you know, a, a little area of Thailand. And we would swoop in with lots of antivirals with a massive team we would give this medication to everyone there and we would be able to contain it where it was. And then if it got outside those borders, we would have like three weeks to stand up everything we needed in the U.S. so that we were totally ready here. And when it arrived, on schedule, of course, we would all be ready, people would know what to do, and, and, and we would, we, it would be a smooth response. Well, uh, this 
flu didn't read the response plans and decided not only to not start in Indonesia, but to be identified in the U.S. And some of the questions I was getting from the beginning were, well, why don't we put up big barriers to Mexico and keep it out? <laughs> and, and, you know, close the borders and hunker down. And it's like, well, actually, you know, it may have gone from here to Mexico. You know, we don't know exactly where this started. Closing the border to Mexico will probably shut off a lot of raw materials that go into, into products that we need here. It would also cut off a lot of medical supplies that are used in hospitals here. And it would do absolutely nothing in slowing the spread of, uh, of this flu. But explaining that and communicating that message was really tough. There was a lot of, uh, of people saying, you know, bad thing happened, close the borders, shut it down, you know, and, and, and we'll be safe. And, and that just doesn't, doesn't work. Um, we, we had as a part of our strategy that all of our actions should be directed at mitigating the impact on people's health. So whatever we recommended, it had to have as its, as its goal um, uh, decreasing the impact of this uh, uh, pandemic on people's health. Um, it couldn't be done for show. It couldn't be done because it, it sounded good. Um, airport screening, those kinds of things uh, fall into the uh, sounds good, good for show, but has no impact on people's health. Um, we would take aggressive action until we knew more. And so, you know, with an emerging infection, when you don't know what's going on, whether it's this or SARS or, or any other new bug, you only have one chance to potentially contain it. And so you go at it hard, you go at it uh, broadly, and then as you learn more, as the science dic dictates that you can change, you back off from that. You don't go up incrementally because you can lose the one chance that you had to control this. And so we went at this very aggressively. Um, we, we, we decided on day one that we would share what we knew, when we knew it, and that we would have regular briefings um, to the public, and we would share everything we had with the international community. So if we didn't know something, we would say, we don't know that. Here's what we're doing to try and get an answer to that. Um, if we did know something, even if it was something that made us uncomfortable, we would share it. And that was all about trying to engender trust in the public so that the public would look to us for information. Um, we wanted to make sure that, that people had information that they could use to make decisions and that they trusted the government as their, as their information uh, source. Um, we, we decided on day one that actions would be based on the best science we had and that as we learned more, we would be willing to change. Uh, we said that our guidance uh, that we would post would often be wrong within a few days. And when we found guidance that was wrong, we would work quickly to, to change it. But we wanted people to realize that this was a work in progress, and it still is uh, to, to this day. Uh, we said that we would expect to see different things in different parts of the country, and this was a good thing, that we could learn from what was going on in different places. And we did, and you're seeing it today. You know, the, yesterday, the news out of Boston was that, that Massachusetts was going to vaccinate prisoners before the general public. Um, by the end of the day, it was no longer doing that. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you're still seeing to this day people in public health deciding to approach vaccination in different ways. Pennsylvania is deciding to, to focus vaccination on young children and, uh, uh, in the schools because children are getting hit hardest by this and schools are a place where, where flu transmits very easily. Other communities are saying we have a very limited amount of vaccine. We're going to go with healthcare workers first. Both good ideas. We can learn from the, the, the different approaches. Um, and then we focused on the importance of this being a shared responsibility, um, that this wasn't something where the government was going to step up and take care of it for everybody, but everyone had a role. Uh, the government had things that uh, it was responsible for. Communities had things that it's re they're responsible for. Schools, families, and individuals. And we put a lot on individual responsibility. The responsibility to... Uh, to stay home when you're sick or keep your kids out of school when they're sick. The importance of washing your hands, of practicing cough hygiene and covering your cough. And uh, those kind of measures are all part of what we do as part of our responsibility to keep this as mild as, as, as possible. Um, and, and we hammered those messages time and time again. Um, you know, our feeling was that you, you couldn't say it enough. From the first day of this pandemic, we took a communication strategy of we would not turn down a single interview. And that meant that you know, across CDC, we had experts at different levels who were always available to the press. If the press wanted to talk to somebody about this, we would be there. 
Uh, we would have a scheduled news conference every day. We would do the morning shows, the evening shows, whenever people wanted. We wanted it to be someone from CDC so that they were getting the right science, uh, the right information out there to make their, their uh, uh, decisions. And that, I think, was, was a, a very uh, effective uh, approach. You know, in, in crisis response, you can do the right thing, but if people don't know it and understand it and trust you, you'll fail. Um, same thing with political leadership. You can do the right thing if you're at the technical level, but if you haven't explained it, if the political leadership doesn't trust you, you're going to fail. And so the communication strategy was a, a critical part of, of what we were doing to, to uh, engender trust. Uh, I want to go through um, uh, one or two examples of, of some of the tough decisions that uh, we had to make during the spring um, and some of the interplay between the technical level of government uh, and the political level. Uh, because the, the fact that this took place um, during transition, I think, really impacted on our ability to work. And, um, you know, being at the technical level at CDC, um, I found it really liberating early on to not have the political le level there. Uh, we were able to decide from a scientific, scientific perspective what should the guidance be, what should the recommendations be, what is the best way to uh, prevent this infection in, uh, in healthcare settings, what, is the, what do we recommend individuals do to protect their health, uh, what should be done in terms of border closure, what should be done in terms of school closure. Uh, we could view these as technical problems that had uh, scientific input and we would generate the guidance, we would vet it within the department and up it would go on the web and we could get that done within a day. Uh, we had, we had uh, as many as 7 million people a day coming to the CDC website for information and we wanted to be fast. We wanted to have information up there that people could use. And we could do that and we could do it quickly in large part because there was not another level of vetting. Well, I learned pretty quickly why it's important at times to have that, that level of, uh, uh, above you. Um, the big question came, what do you do with schools? Sc there have been a lot of planning for bird flu around community mitigation and what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions. Things you can do in a community to slow the, the spread of an infectious agent. These things involve social distancing. So if we were implementing them here, instead of seating the way you are, it would be every other and every other row. We would keep people uh, apart a little bit so that germs aren't being shared so, so easily. You might ask churches not to, not to meet on a Sunday. You might ask movie theaters to, to be closed, or you might tell them that they have to close. You might cancel sporting events at schools and, and large gatherings. Um, these kind of things, uh, there's modeling that would show they could slow the spread of an infectious agent in a community. There's debate over what the impact would be and how aggressive these measures have to be in order to really see that impact. But theoretically, if the, the bug was bad enough, um, you might want to go that way. And uh, the community mitigation measures went through a lot of vetting uh, around the country, a lot of community engagement around those. And the way it worked was that you would, you would put in place uh, measures based on how severe the infection is. And so the critical thing you needed to know was how easy it spread and how severe it was. And, and uh, we came up with a pandemic severity scale of one to five. Uh, 1918 is a five. Uh, uh, I think 1956 was a one. Uh, one is not very severe. It's normally in a flu season, 36,000 people die. 200,000 are, are hospitalized. So a regular flu season is pretty bad. A, a, le a level one pandemic is up a little bit from that. So you might see 50,000 people die instead of 36,000 people die. So the big question we had with this was, okay, where are we on the pandemic severity scale? So there have been maybe 20, 30, maybe 40 cases in the U.S., um, so far. They were all pretty mild. Uh, people had done well. Uh, many of them probably wouldn't have been diagnosed if people weren't looking hard for them. So that's looking pretty much like a one. Uh, then you look across the border to Mexico and people are dying left and right. The hospitals are overflowing. It looks really, really bad. And you're thinking, okay, that looks like a five. Okay, so you average the two out and you're at a two and a half. And so 
the, the big discussion was where are we on the pandemic severity scale and what do you do if you don't know? If this is a mild pandemic, you don't want to shut down society. Uh, that has major consequences economically. It has major consequences in terms of people's lives, their ability to, to, to function. Uh, we don't have a good safety net uh, in this country, so telling people that uh, to stay home when they're sick, if they uh, if they work for a day wage, you know, they're going to lose their job. They won't be able to put food on the table. Um, telling people to keep their kids home, uh, if there's no uh, child care available for them, no one to take care of that child, uh, and they need to go to work, how do you do that? Well, if you're at a pandemic five, you figure a way to do it, and you get you get systems in place pretty quickly. If you're at a pandemic level one. Um, the, the benefit to that isn't, uh, isn't, isn't going to be seen. So we had to decide pretty quickly what to do about schools. And the decision was, uh, given what we saw in Mexico, and we could not explain the difference between what was going on in Mexico and in the U.S., um, we thought that maybe we're early in what's going on in the U.S., and we have the opportunity to slow this thing down. Um, you're never going to stop a pandemic, but the goal is if you slow it down, it could spread out the burden on your healthcare system. So instead of everyone getting sick and coming in at once and overburdening your ERs and your, your hospital wards and your intensive care unit, you spread it out over a longer period of time and your system may be able to take care of everybody. So we quickly issued guidance that you should close the school with your first confirmed or suspect case of swine flu. And that went out. And schools across the country started closing. And um, given what we knew at the time, it, it, it seemed to make a lot of sense. But every day we learned more. And we started to learn uh, uh, more about what was going on in Mexico. There was a team of about 40 people from CDC who were in Mexico uh, working with uh, Mexicans and Canadians and others uh, as part of WHO and PAHO teams to try and understand what was going on. And when they looked, what they saw was there was flu all over the country. All over Mexico, in communities, there was mild flu. And so what was being seen by the press and in the hospitals was the tip of the iceberg. It was the, those who were severely ill. But it wasn't necessarily a flu that was that much worse than what we were seeing here. And so we were able to move very quickly from um, a recommendation of closing schools for uh, the first suspect case to um, Closing schools for 14 days, okay? Uh, yeah, close schools for 14 days because 14 days is the length of time that um, someone can shed uh, the flu virus. That would, that, that would work. Um, uh, and then we move from that to keep a child out of school for 14 days. Um, instead of closing down the school, just keep the child out of school for 14 days. Well, around this period of time, um, I was invited to go to the White House to... Uh, brief the president and the, and the cabinet on what was going on in swine flu. Um, and I came and did the briefing and then afterwards I was pulled into a meeting to discuss school closure. And there in the room was the, the new Secretary of Health, uh, Kathleen Sebelius, who'd been on board for four days. Um, uh, she talks about this pandemic as being, uh, you know, the nice gift in her hospitality basket when she, when she arrived. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Secretary Sebelius was there, and uh, Napolitano from Homeland Security, and Arnie Duncan from Education, and Rahm Emanuel, and David Axelrod, and uh, all of the, the political layer that I hadn't really had to, to deal with before. And um, in the discussions, it became pretty clear that uh, there was more to making a decision about school closure than science. You know, for one, the science around it was pretty thin. Um, throughout my time at the White House, uh, the President and others kept saying, we want all of our decisions to be science-based, which for me was extremely refreshing. And, uh, but what do you do when the science isn't very deep? Then many of these decisions are informed by science, but they're policy. And a decision to close the schools goes way beyond science. It goes, it goes to the Department of Education and their mission to keep children in the seats learning. Well, that seems to make a lot of sense. You want to keep kids in school learning. And, and the uh, Department of Commerce that wants to keep people working. And Department of Transportation that wants to keep stuff moving. Um, and Homeland Security, which is in charge overall for any large-scale emergency. So it became very clear that 
others had a vested interest in this and that the decision about school closures was not one that should be made at CDC. It should be informed by CDC science. And uh, so we're sitting there talking over what the science says and what it doesn't say and what our guidance is. And uh, one of the politicals in the room says, okay, let me take a crack at this. And he starts writing out some guidance. And I leaned over to the Secretary of Health and said, you know, Madam Secretary, I'm not very comfortable with this. And uh, after a while, the, the political, I'll, I'll protect his name, he, he starts reading out what he had written. And one of the other politicals said, you know, I don't think it's such a good idea for you to be writing scientific guidance. And <laughs> so the guy balled it up and threw it in the corner. And the, the secretary and I uh, um, well, went off to a meeting with all the governors. And about halfway through this, this teleconference, they come in and they hand me this, new, this guidance. And they said, can you read that? and let us know if it's supported by the science. And I read through it and it said you know, that a, if a child has flu, they should be kept out uh, for seven days, um, at which point they'll be reevaluated. And within seven days, there'd be new guidance that would help determine um, whether it needed to be longer than that. And I said, yeah, you know, that's within the realm of what science would say. Uh, he said, can, can you live with that? I said, definitely. And so that was how we generated the, the next level of guidance. And it struck me that it's a much better way uh, to, to do things. I mean, we, every four years, have the opportunity to elect a government. Um, and those people need to represent the societal views and values when it comes to things like this. Um, and there are certain things that are technical. It's clearly a technical decision as to which drug sh should you use to treat influenza and for how many days. Um, but it's not a technical decision in terms of how do you balance these competing priorities when you're trying to, to, to keep, people, uh, keep people well. Um, so it, it was a very, uh, very much of a learning experience for me. Um, but the, the downside is that after that, whenever we wanted to get a guidance up on the, on the web, it was no longer we'd start in the morning, it would be up at night. I mean, you needed cross-clearance by Department of Education and Homeland Security and all of the others to make sure that what we were putting up was, was uh, uh, right and represented the best, the best policy. Um, wasn't so good for speed, um, but definitely good in terms of, of, of getting it right. Um, so where are we today? We're, you know, this pandemic's continuing. Um, I think that, that there are still the same issues of trust that we were dealing with in the spring. Uh, I'm a little concerned that uh, um, the trust is, is, is uh, not as great as it, as it was. Um, I think that some of that is during a period of real crisis when there's a big unknown threat, um, the public and the press are, are willing to give the government a lot more leeway than they are now, where we've all been living with uh, swine flu for six months and are realizing that uh, are realizing that it's not uh, 1918, that this is something that can hit some people really hard. Uh, it's something that most people are able to handle pretty well. Um, and that, that everyone can have an opinion on this. Um, so so it's, it, it's, it's, a different, it's a different period. Um, my, my role in this is, um, is new. Um, my role is one that, that um, I, th I think uh, can contribute to, to public health. You know, I, I got a big appreciation in the spring for the importance of, of communication and health communication. And um, I think that, that in the past, in, pub in my career in public health, uh, I had viewed the media, um, uh, the popular press in particular, as, as, as an enemy and a group to really avoid and one that was always trying to, to get us and get me. Um, now I'm one of them. Uh, but no, I, my perspective has, has flipped, and I think that, that we ignore the press and we, we ignore public communication to our own detriment, that it's a really powerful way to get out messages. Um, when we look at the health problems that we face as a nation, uh, so many of them now are, are related to behavior, uh, whether it's nutrition and the things we choose to eat, uh, exercise, how we, how we choose to live our lives, um, or things that we have no control over, how society shapes a lot of those things. The press will be very important in shaping behavior and helping to shape, shape policy, and I, I look forward to, uh, to, uh, to working on that. Um, I also look forward to, 
seeing what comes out of this college. Uh, you know, when I looked at the, at the mission and, and the professions that are, are captured here at, uh, uh, at BU in, in Sargent College, I think that you all will really have an important role to play. And, uh, you know, keep your horizons vast. You can, you can take what you do in health in, in many different directions that can all have impact. And you don't have to do the same thing uh, for the rest of your career. So um, I wanted to leave uh, a lot of time for questions, and I've done that. So thank you very much. Yes? Uh, you said that uh, you were thinking about your three weeks and uh, what you could do with them. Did you have ideas for changing the CDC? If yes. You, could you share with them? Well, um, yeah, I had a two-week planning period. So the, from when I got the first call to when I got the call that I was starting, um, I, I, uh, I pulled out two of my favorite leadership books. One is uh, um, Good to Great by uh, Jim Collins. And the other was... Um, uh, what to do in the first hundred days of government. And so I pulled those out and I mapped out my first couple weeks of what I was going to do. And uh, the Collins book, uh, one of the big principles is get the right people on the bus. And so I, 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 I laid out pretty quickly who I wanted to bring up as deputies, acting deputies while I was going to be acting director so that we could get a team in place. And uh, looked at what I thought the big priorities were for the agency. The, the biggest was uh, 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 the Recovery Act money that, that came very quickly. We had to, we had to uh, mobilize as an agency to determine how some of that money could be used to promote health. And uh, just recently, a few weeks ago, they released, the, the White House released the, uh, uh, the wellness plan. There's, there's a big block of, I think, $700 million that communities are applying for as, in a sense, demonstration projects to show how, as a community, you can come together and promote health. And they're focusing on nutrition, smoking, and uh, physical activity. So we worked on that. And then the other part was uh, trying to engage folks across CDC to understand what people in the agency were feeling and, and what things people felt they needed to, uh, we needed to change. I wanted to prepare documents for the permanent director so that when they came in, they had, a, in a sense, a, 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 uh, what we call an emergency preparedness, a situational awareness. They knew what they were coming in for and, and what the big issues were. You never thought you were going to be the permanent director? No, I mean, they told me day one, they said that uh, they wanted someone from the outside to come in and uh, that I was not going to be under consideration. Yeah. Hi, uh, I have a question here, curiosity. Uh, it's related to preparedness. You talk about 1980, 1956, and maybe something in around 1980s, and it's approximately every 20 and 30 years it's coming back. And you know that is a different combination of H and N, H5, N5, yes. H and N3, now H1, N1. So uh, regarding preparedness, what uh, people are thinking or doing as what are the situations when another mutation happens? Right. Because we have the frozen strains from 1918, 56, around 80s. So how they're working on that so that you can have a projection that yeah. what is coming now and what can come in future. Yeah, I mean, the flu, I, I'm not a flu. A, at CDC, everyone's got like their little thing. Um, and I'm not a flu guy. Um, I just play one on TV. Um, no, but uh, uh, so there are people who study flu virus and, and track it and try and predict what the changes will be. And everyone was thinking the H1N1 uh, uh, the avian strain was going to be the next one. And it's still out there. I mean, uh, before the, the swine flu hit, I would be giving talks and people say, whatever happened to that bird flu? It's like, well, there's cases every year and they're still going. Um, the one thing that's keeping that strain from becoming a, a pandemic strain is that it doesn't transmit easily person to person. Um, almost all the cases had very close contact with poultry, either you know, living in, in, uh, in a room or, or uh, uh, slaughtering poultry or, or, or other things. So people are tracking strains and mutations and, and how they go around the world. For it to become a pandemic strain, it really has to be a big shift from, from what we've seen in the past. Uh, but when it comes to preparedness, um, we take an all-hazards approach to preparedness. The things that are done to prepare for a pandemic will help prepare us for a terrorist attack or the next Hurricane Katrina or you know, the next event of, of any size. 
and our ability to predict what it's going to be is really, really bad. Um, I, th I think that um, one, of the, one of the difficult things in, in government, I think in, in, in public health for sure, is that um, you get this complacency that builds up. And if there isn't a crisis every few years, it's very easy to see the money go elsewhere. I mean, uh, uh, it was very easy for politicians in Louisiana not to invest in the, in, in the levies. Uh, the likelihood that something would happen on their watch is not very great. It's very easy for Congress to say, why invest in preparedness? The likelihood is not very great. Um, so you know, this pandemic, I, I hope, is a wake-up call and will ensure that states uh, who are losing a lot of their public health workforce um, will continue to see, uh, uh, see money coming in so that they can remain prepared. I don't know. Do you have an idea of what the next strain is going to be? <laughs> Yeah. That's what I was thinking. It's not only the strains, but what are the situations at the time, 1918, 56, around 80s, and now, yeah. uh, whether this, there is any similarity between the situations which can give rise to another mutant strain, whether yeah. that can be addressed or not. Yeah. That's also another question. Well, there's, there definitely is you know, concern. So many of the emerging infectious diseases t uh, take place at this human-animal interface, <coughs> and, and you know, there are parts of the world where you see where you see this occurring with, with great regularity. Um, you know, Southeast Asia, where a lot of the avian strains is, uh, were taking place. Southern China, where SARS emerged, where you had all these different species of animals in these markets that were sharing. Um, when you see that sharing take place, uh, you can imagine it doesn't take a lot of mutations to develop something that can then uh, uh, transmit to others. Yes? And the political, because you did manage, mention political uh, yeah. questions with the eradication of polio worldwide. You know, uh, I'm I'm looking forward to doing a series for ABC on on um, uh, very focused health problems around the world that that I think have a political influence or problems that that, that shouldn't be. And polio is one of those. There's been a major uh, initiative underway to eradicate polio, and it's down to. Uh, I think last I looked was five countries, um, and uh, you know it's it's achievable. Uh, you get, keep getting that close, and then sh it it it, uh, it it slips away. But but problems like that, I think it's important to bring to the awareness of the American public, because they're not seen here. And you know the debate that's going on now around the flu vaccine and vaccine safety. Uh, I think uh, it, it, it's 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 pretty incredible how we've come as a country in terms of how we view vaccines, uh, how the public views vaccines, something that was viewed as you know, m the, this miracle, uh, eliminating polio. Parents could send their kids to the swimming pool in the summer, uh, you know, eliminating whooping cough and, and tetanus and measles and, and chicken pox, um, is now viewed with, with a lot of fear and skepticism. And, you know, I've worked in developing countries and have seen kids die from a lot of those diseases. If you're not seeing them on a regular basis, it's very hard to weigh the risk from a vaccine, which is very, very small, with the risk from something that you've never seen and you're not seeing regularly. And I think the fact that so many people are seeing mild cases of flu, they're, they're, uh, it's leading to some concern about vaccine safety. And uh, you know, we have more experience with flu vaccine. 100 million people every year get flu vaccines. We have more experience with that than just about any, any other vaccine, but there's this feeling that, uh, that it's not safe and that uh, the government's trying to pull a fast one on this. It's, it's very interesting. Yes? Well, actually, ties in with your point earlier about um, the ease with which one can get complacent once there's not a crisis. And, uh, but it does raise the problem that we saw, I believe, in preceding eight years that in order to foment a crisis, one may have to hype a problem and frighten the public, which may then, in the longer run, undermine public trust, particularly if the only things that are offered on the part of the government are uh, commands, as opposed to providing people with the means to take care of themselves. And this may undermine the public trust and make them less willing to believe. And I wonder how one addresses that if the issue is losing funding, whereas 
funding may be needed to build the sort of basic everyday public health infrastructure that makes people resilient enough to withstand emergencies. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's a great point. Um, it's a fine line, and I, th I think that uh, those in government and those in the media have to be very careful about that issue of, of overhype. Um, and you know, we need to acknowledge that this is a mild flu. This H1N1 is mild flu. Um, that being said, we have the opportunity to save probably thousands of lives by vaccinating. But uh, we need to make it clear that this is not 1918. Um, this is a new strain of flu. Thousands of people will die. If you get vaccinated, your risk, which is already small, will be less. Um, and if a lot of people get vaccinated, then the risk to everyone else goes, goes down. But it has to, I think, trying to engender fear is not the way to go, and, and it, it can backfire. It's giving people information that they can use. Yeah. Hi, thank Hi, Dr. Bresser. Um, can you speak a little bit to the point of H1N1 moving into some of the least developed countries now and how, while it's still a mild flu um, for more developed countries that can respond to it, how can they prepare and respond to that when they have so much other underlying diseases right. and conditions? You know, it's, that's, that's a real challenge. Um, you know, vaccine is, is allocated around the world by wealth. And, uh, you know, the wealthier countries are, are being asked to donate a certain allotment to less developed countries, but still it's going to be a small amount for the number of people who, who could benefit. And, you know, I haven't seen studies in terms of the impact in, in less developed countries, but I would imagine in places where there are high rates of malnutrition and other co-infections, it's going to be quite, quite great. Um, I attended the World Health Assembly with um, the secretary back in, in either late May or, or early June, and one of the issues that was being discussed there was the issue of, of equity and health equity, and how do you, how do you promote that? And it's, it's very hard. Politically, there's no government around that could say, instead of vaccinating our own population, we're going we're gonna to give half our vaccine abroad because that's a, a fair approach that just wouldn't, wouldn't fly. Yeah. I don't know. Do you have a solution? <laughs> yeah. But it's, it, it's, it's an important one to be able to, to work through. And I mean, one of the, the longer-term solutions is to try and build more capacity. So, you know, you're starting to see more vaccine manufacturing taking place in developing countries. You're seeing vaccines that are being made um, for diseases that are only occurring in the less developed world. Um, different models to try and approach that uh, because it's the model, a, a profit-driven model is always going to lead to a, an inequitable distribution of, of scarce things like vaccine. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, Really very nice talk. Thank you very much. In, enjoyed it significantly. Could you address um, the relationship between the morbidity of this H1N1 and age-related issues? Seasonal flu, for example, is predominantly a problem as far as morbidity and mortality for the very young and the very old. And yet, this H1N1 has its greatest impact on presumably the healthiest part of the population, late teens to, to right. late 40s. Yeah. And the same was seen in 1918. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that's the hallmark of a pandemic, uh, that the young are, are hit harder by pandemic strains, um, the elderly are hit by, by seasonal strains. Um, and there are a number of, of, of theories that are out there. Uh, surveys that look at, at, at protective immunity, antibody uh, surveys, will show that those who are older um, have some protection to the strain that's circulating. If you were born before 1957, it may be that there was a strain that circulated before then that was similar, that's giving some degree of, of, of cross protection. Um, so those who are, are younger don't have that protection or at greater risk. There's also a theory that, that um, younger people with a healthier immune system, their, their immune system themselves, uh, itself can um, come on so strong that that can be part of the pathology, that that can help flood, uh, flood their lungs and, and uh, lead to some of the consequences of, of, of that illness. So, you know, some of these cases of, of uh, healthy, healthy young people and the pathology showing 
lots of fluid and blood in their lungs, that may be more of the, the, the uh, immune response for the big cytokine storm uh, tackling that. Um, it is interesting, though, that um, although the antibody studies were just showing protection in the very old, uh, the vaccine studies were showing that probably more people have some degree of protection than was originally thought because the initial uh, feeling was that people were going to need two doses of vaccine to mount a sufficient immune response. But what they found was that adults or children, anyone over age 10, one dose was enough to give a very robust immune response. And that's what you normally see with priming, where someone's already seen it once before. So uh, that may be also part of the reason why there's not as much um, uh, mortality as, as uh, uh, was initially feared. Yes. And Dr. Besser, uh, first of all, I'd like to <clears throat> thank you for being a beacon of sensibility back in May um, when the uh, swine flu first emerged, and I'd watch you, um, you know, doing your press conferences in the morning. But uh, I have the, the honor of uh, t chairing a task force here at Boston University on H1N1, and we face this challenge on a weekly basis as to how to manage it and whatnot. With your collective expertise, both as a medical expert and now a media medical expert, um, one of the issues we face is communication to our community and what's the proper and most effective way of doing that and are we saying the right things. What are, what are some of your recommendations regarding communication regarding, you know, surrounding this issue? Yeah, you know, I, I think letting people know what you know when you know it. You know, so if there's an outbreak on campus that, you know, that you're out, out front with what's going on, what, what people can do to, to help protect themselves, and what measures you're, you're, you're taking to in, engender that trust, and have sources of information people know that they can turn to to find out what's going on and, and, and what they can do. Um, you know, one of the concerns I have right now, um, and that we're going to be talking about tonight on, on World News, is um, the kind of rev up of demand, and there's no supply. Um, so, you know, this call for everyone to get vaccinated uh, and the, the departmental website right now, if you click on flu.gov, first thing you see is that pregnant women should get vaccinated immediately. If you click on any of the sites, it says come back later to find out when vaccine is coming, if you click on any state. That's not a good thing. Um, I think that... Um, <laughs> You need to have, I mean, yes, pregnant women should get vaccinated as soon as vaccine is available in their community. And they need to turn to these sources, boom, 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 to find out when it might be in the community. And if it's not gonna be here until mid-November or late November, say it, because people are, those people, you've got these two camps, those who are, this is much ado about nothing, and then there's other camp that, I wanna do something about this to protect myself, but what can I do? So in the meantime, if you can't get vaccine, practice those measures. Wash your hands, cover your cough, stay home when you're sick, have other people do that. There are things you can do, uh, but vaccine is not here yet. Even though there's been a lot in the press that vaccine is here, we're hearing from across the country, it's not here yet. And uh, what I learned today from the CC press conference is there are delays in production. So it's gonna be a little while coming and people need to to adjust their expectations on that. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Besser, we yes. feel really privileged to have had you here to give us insight into this time during your career and something that's so important to the American population. Um, I know you're extremely busy and we really appreciate the fact that you came here and squeezed us in between doing uh, the world news tonight and all the other things that you're doing. <laughs> uh, it's really uh, an honor to have you here and uh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, there's a reception upstairs. Uh, Dr. Besser can be here for about half an hour and also any of the parents who are here, I'd really like to meet them so everybody's uh, welcome to come and say hello. Thank you so much. Thank you.